I would like to uh, thank Ian for fantastic introduction to my talk and which will make me uh, focus on, on, on uh, things that you may not have heard about. Um, as Scala says, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this speech on talk on behalf of Coke and Pregnancy and Child and uh, Frank Kelly, our manager and, uh, um, um, our managing editor is also joining the call in case there are some difficult questions that I'm unable to answer, she will help me. Do we have a problem with evidence untrustworthiness? Um, Ian says, of course, and you have, and Ben Moll, who is, uh, who Ian mentioned, and is a uh, professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Monash University, and actually also one of our editors, certainly thinks so, and has published extensively on, on that topic. Ian has basically uh, talked about this, of all of this much more eloquently than I can. Now, as far as, uh, Cochrane is concerned, the question is, can we rely on scientific journals to sort out this mess? And I would put it to, to you that we cannot. And I have written, put some of my thoughts on the paper in this editorial for American Journal of Ops and Gynae, explaining my thoughts as why I think that journals are actually part of the problem rather than a solution. Peer reviewers and journal editors not only have a the unenviable task of gathering the evidence, but also being asked to be judge and a jury. They have uh, inadequate tools to detect scientific fraud, and that actually goes also for uh, Cochrane reviewers. Um, and even when we succeed against all odds, uh, we may face the pot potential of legal action, and I have certainly been uh, threatened by legal action and has been accused of uh, all sorts of things and um, my my employer my university actually had to basically uh, protect me by threatening legal action against the authors of fabricated reviews who have accused me of all sorts of things so that is not trivial um, and most importantly, I would put it to you that for publishers in academic institutions, every proven case of scientific misconduct is a stain of their integrity with potentially serious financial and legal implications. So there is very little incentive, I would argue, to actually do this work. Right, so what is, what are we going to do about it? We have put on a, on a web, in a public domain, our thoughts and our actions um, which is basically a uh, first few steps on the long journey that Ian um, wants us to take. Um, of course, Ian talked about tools. We have a, we can talk about whether whether Ian approach is interesting and certainly one way. We we wanted to basically be uh, took slightly different approach and did look for the tool. Tools, one of these in nature we've, is an interesting, but we felt completely unworkable. So yes, we came up with um, our own a tool that you can actually, that is summarized here, and you can read about it on, on our web page. It essentially has um, four key themes, research governance, based on characteristics, feasibility results. None of these are going to be surprised to you. However, um, it is important uh, at this juncture for me to stress that our current focus is not on the tools because these are, going, uh, these are going to change and possibly even disappear if Ian has his way. Uh, our current focus is on the feasibility of, of implementation or whatever we end up doing. And in the best tradition of Cochrane, we wanted to do something really, really simple and end up with absolute monster of flowchart. But we're absolutely determined to simplify it and, and we'll continue to work on this. The only thing that I wanted to, uh, to highlight in this flowchart is this business that after some sort of painful soul searching, we decided that actually Cochrane Pregnancy and Childbirth Editorial Office will send queries on behalf of the 
uh, uh, to trial autos on behalf of Coca and Rivi Autos, because we are now facing the situation that autos of some trials may actually receive four or five or 10 or 15 questions from 10 different researchers around the world. And we think this is also an untenable situation. And therefore we, uh, we basically feel that the, the way to do that is to approach uh, the trial authors questioning issues if they arise from the positive screening tool on behalf of the Cochrane. Well, you, you can imagine the delight of our Cochrane, uh, of our group editorial team and, and Fran when we sort of agree to do that because it is a huge amount of uh, effort needed to do that, but we, we believe that is worthwhile. Also, our approach has been rather than include everything and then subgrouping untrustworthy with, with, uh, uh, and trustworthy stuff, we feel very, very strongly that untrustworthy, potentially untrustworthy uh, uh, staff, uh, studies should not be included in a systematic reviews in the first place, because amongst other things, if these studies are included in the, the Cochrane reviews, it, it gives them credibility that they should never have. Um, just some data. Um, we currently have five published reviews that have used our screening tool. And you can see um, there are one with two trials with no concerns, one study three out of 13 did not meet the criteria, 13 out of 20 didn't meet criteria, three out of seven did not meet criteria, nine out of 30 did not meet the criteria. So Ian is right. We are not, we are not talking that they're all fabricated, it's just that we have serious, uh, sufficiently serious concerns not to trust them. And the beauty of Cochrane reviews is that we don't have to do um, a retraction or, or, or anything, we can just nicely put them in a waiting classification box. Um, all of these have been uh, labeled as untrustworthy after attempt to contact the authors. Some have replied unsatisfactorily, most of them did not reply at all. Um, just to show you uh, um, um, what, what can actually happen, uh, some of you may be aware that a Cochrane logo is actually based on a, what we consider to be an iconic review of uh, antenatal corticosteroids uh, uh, given to mother to prevent neonatal respiratory morbidity in infants who are at risk for being born premature. So, uh, and this review has been a flagship of Cochrane for years and years and years and years. Uh, we have recently decided to apply our untrustworthiness trustworthiness criteria and long behold we had to remove six trials from it uh, and here is the impact not a uh, shattering uh, a little bit uh, um, little difference in a in a actually relative risk of main primary outcome and uh, evidence downgraded from high to moderate slight sort of changes so Fewer infants um, uh, and change, small change in the size of effect. It is a work in progress. We are now thinking of how to graphically present our data. And this is uh, something that we have actually come up with. This is this, um, essentially, we, we are sort of mimicking what's happening with the risk of bias tool. Uh, thinking about whether we can actually in this box add, uh, add some text, uh, toying with this. This has not uh, yet been published, but hopefully it will be soon in one of our reviews. And one thing that is currently also interesting is this business of statistics. And we are now toying with, uh, with the idea of recalculating p-values when they exist. And this is just an example of when you actually look at the p-values as published, and then you try to recalculate them, you get completely different results. And um, this is, of course, time consuming, but also potentially one red flags. The question is how many red flags we can cope with. So we currently have uh, 25 reviews in preparation 
that will be using our tool. And as you can imagine, there are tons of un unanswered questions. Uh, the, the ones that from Cochrane perspective, we are interested in what are the review authors' views on feasibility and workload that these checklists are going to um, uh, create. And Ian has basically touched on that and his solution. Um, what will be the response actions from excluded authors? That will be interesting. And of course, there are tons of unknown unknowns. Thank you very much.